radio to Marcus at the back, you know, like the British claps, all the lively clap, and I should run on, you know, with my arms in the air to a lovely style. So thank you for a very warm welcome. Um, as Nick said, I'm going to be talking about authentic leadership. I'm going to be talking about authentic leadership and culture, culture by design. Um, so kind of two prongs to what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, as Nick said, I'm Sonia Gill. I'm the founder and director of a company called Heads Up. And at Heads Up, we specialise in helping primary schools become outstanding. For those of you in education or with children, you'll probably have heard of an organisation called Ofsted. Mm -hmm. yeah? Our inspectors, our school inspectors who go in. Anybody work in education? I need to go on those few. Fantastic, maybe. <laughs> um, anybody got children? Yeah. So what do you do? You look at your, your school's offset grade and you get a feel for what they're like. Um, so yes, you know, offset use the word outstanding. It's the highest accolade a school can get. When I'm talking about outstanding, I'm talking about what I believe is more than just the offset criteria. I'm talking about creating exceptional education in the fullest sense. Yeah. Yes, literacy is important, and yes, numeracy is important. But there are a lot of things we need to learn in life, aren't there? Yeah, and our schools are fantastic places and the best places to equip our next generation. Because you know what? In about 30 years, it's all there, it's not ours. And I do that by helping schools create an outstanding culture, which I believe is an enabler. But before I get into the main body of this talk, what I'd really like to get a feel for is what you're hoping to get from it. And then, you know, if I'm not going to cover it, you can just leave and save yourself an hour and a half. <laughs> or you can stay and be curious. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just turn to someone next to you. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to kind of just, just tell them what you're hoping to get. And then I'm going to ask a few of you to be brave and share with me why you're here tonight. There's a golden morning teaching. Well, there was at least when I was actively teaching. Now it's about seven seconds when you answer the question. So, who'd like to share so we, we were talking about the idea of um, meeting the community, but also hearing stuff around education, what that means, because we're all kind of interested in education and looking at not necessarily reforming it or changing it, but being involved in it. So we're kind of curious about that. Great, thank you. Rob's breaking the ice now. It's easy after that. And there are no wrong answers. Well, you might just save yourself a bit of time to see if you can go down the public and water. I might be meeting your needs also. Marcus, for you? Yeah, I was. I'm interested to see what you, what it was you took from Animas that you were able to then use uh -huh. in your business. Interesting. I'm not sure I'm going to answer that for a while, actually. Um, but maybe at the end of questions, then I can try and answer that. Just remind me, it's quite what I might have gone. I think about your education, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess just maybe a bit of knowledge on how to get people that work for you, you're in a position of leadership, to kind of reflect the values that you have, mm -hmm. and particularly those who are like resistant. Yes, excellent. Well, not excellent, you've got people who are resistant, but um, yeah, I, I'm going to be touching on that. Um, I'm going to, if it's okay, just plug my book. So I have my book there, Journey to <coughs> particularly um, useful I'd say to educationists and, and that kind of situation where you're trying to get people on board, you're trying to instigate change. And you try not to do it like a dictator, because let's face it, how often does that work? Anybody else need to share? Is it safe to say the rest of you are along for hopefully an enjoyable evening? Yeah? Yes. Okay, yes. that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well. I've always been quite interested in what makes people successful. Yeah, and I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, Richard Branson, Lola's success, or Tony Robbins' success, but just, you know, success in life. And I've thought about this a lot in terms of, you know, my own life, what things have helped me out, what things haven't. And I don't know about you, but as you get older, the years start to go by, the life lines start to increase. Um, I, I personally, I've been able to kind of understand my own background better. And one thing that's happened, or a realisation that's happened to me quite recently, and I'm curious to know if it's happened to you guys, is, does anybody find they open their mouth and their mother comes out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people put their hands up. Or their father? I don't think we're the same for guys. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> yeah but let, let, me, let me gauge this. This is the first time I've asked this question. So put your hands up. If you open your mouth and your mum comes out. Hands up to men and women there. If your dad comes out. Yeah, okay. You know, it's a strange thing, isn't it? Because you kind of go, oh, yeah, I'm a bit of a you know, I am, 
I'm a product of myself and nothing else. And then one day you're saying things, or I'm talking to my nieces, and I can hear my mum. Don't get me wrong, I love my mum. I adore my mum. She is my absolute heroine in life. Um, but it's still a bit scary, isn't it? And the thing is, we all have these personal cultural legacies, our family cultural legacies. Um, they, they, they come to us in different ways, you know, they come from our family, they come from behaviours in our family, they come from the sayings in our family, they come from our school, they come from the place we grow up in, they come from the organisations we belong to. And, you know, I, I grew up um, in Hollow Town. You didn't know Hollow Town? Um, anybody seen the program Educating Essex? Yeah, yeah. So Paul School's school, yeah, Vic Goddard, head teacher there. That school is the school right next to the school I went to, which was complicated now she was academy. Um, and Harlow is, you know, it was a a new town built after the war. Um, you know, it is a very white working class area. And you know, when you look at the stats, and you know, we all know that 80% of all stats are made up, but when you look at the stats, you know, socioeconomic background, the kind of, you know, the demographic that, that makes up Harlow, you kind of go, well, you know, below average chances in life, certainly at the time I was, I was growing up. Comprehensive school, hmm, and my school wasn't the best in the town. It's a fantastic school. I've been back there many times. I love seeing my head, my old head. I love seeing my previous teachers. You know, it, it, they, they've done an incredible job there. You know, at the time, it wasn't, it wasn't regarded as one of the best schools there. They were really turning it around. So technically, I should have actually done all right in life. And I think I've done okay. Yeah, I'm not saying I've got a massive success, but, you know, I've, I've got a nice life. I have a nice flat in North London. You know, I run my own business. There was, you know, nice things that happen to me. Now, I'd love to say that I was a local girl made good. You know, and tell you some story about how, you know, up to my personal life and determination and, you know, I went through this and I went through that. Yeah, everybody goes through stuff. You know, this isn't a rags to riches story at all. But my parents are Indian. They moved over here. I'm sure not, not before, I should have a word about that. But they moved over here many years ago. In India, they were very upper class. They come from a very educated family. My dad went to the equivalent of Eton. Now, I'm not saying it didn't matter what social environment I was in, what cultural environment I was in, because, yeah, that would have an impact on me. But there were certain sayings, certain behaviours, certain expectations, certain norms that were just part of our family cultural legacy. I'm not saying that's necessarily an Indian legacy. I'm not saying it's just a, a, a Gill family legacy. It's a combination of things. So some of the things... Some of the things that um, <coughs> you know, I began to realise that, that were just kind of you know, part of our family, part of who we are, for me and my sister, was, you know, you're Indian, so you get A's at school. Anybody else got an Indian heritage here? I don't know if you have a similar, a similar one, but it's like you, you'll do well academically. Yeah. Yeah? Something like that. Yeah, it's just, it's just an expectation, isn't it? Like you'll have a cup of tea in the morning. Yeah. Yeah? It's just it, there's no, there's no grey or anything, it's just you're doing well at school. So, do you know what? We worked hard to do well at school. Didn't get A's in everything all the time. Um, when you did end up being top of the year group and getting 98% in the maths test, your dad was saying, well, why wasn't it 100? You know? <laughs> Stuff like that. But that was just say, I mean, honestly, I think I realised this about five years ago. Various sayings that we have in our families that, that just carry on a perpetuated cultural legacy. So when I hear my mum talking, you know, I'm talking to my nieces. I'm like, well, why isn't that? I don't think she's getting, you know, 11, 5, 5, 8. Or actually, it's my niece and she's in year, year, year 4 and actually she's, she's average. Sorry, my niece doesn't come out average. I can hear my dad, I can hear my mum, I can hear all of it, give it a break, she's year 4, we just death. But, you know, we have all these own, our own personal legacies, our family legacies, our cultural legacies that we're not always aware of. And it was quite a long time before I found out my own ones in terms of what my, my, my family were like in India because, quite frankly, you know, it was busy when I was growing up. Yeah, and we didn't have, you know, we were disconnected from our family geographically, so we weren't immersed in with those grandparents and lots of aunts and uncles around to understand it. But you're, we all have our own individual ones. And can I just say, I don't say, you know, oh, you get AIDS, to brag or anything like that. Um, it was just an expectation, which is part of our <coughs> culture. 
It's one that we're now passing on to my users. And it's a funny thing, because sometimes you try not to, or sometimes you try to resist it, or to think about it, but it's kind of ingrained. Try me. So the thing about these, these legacies in ourselves, our own individuals, is that we know some, we become aware of them. Like one day I realised that was one of my factors. Um, some of them we realise and we reject. And some of them we're yet to discover. And I'm just going to give you a moment to think about, and if you want to, but only if you want to, talk to the person next to you about what some of yours might be. And then if anyone wants to share, I realise it's a deeply personal thing, so I won't be offended if nobody does. But you know, if you don't mind sharing one, then, then I'll invite you to afterwards. Yeah? And like I say, if you want to just think yourself, do that. If you want to talk to somebody next to you, please do that. But I just want to give you a moment to think about what, what are those sayings in your family? It might be those moments where your mum or dad comes out of your mouth. So as we were talking, I was kind of going, no, oh, there isn't any, can't really think of any. And then I, I stumbled upon my love for rum and relaxing. And that's very much my dad. <laughs> uh, everything will be okay in the end. You don't need to worry about it. Have a drink and then see what comes tomorrow. How do you feel about that, Morgan? It's okay, I like my rum, so yeah. I'm quite okay about that. Cool. Although, yeah, I, will, I will say that at times he's a bit too laid back. So you kind of have to just not slip into tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow yeah. and tomorrow. Although, yeah, I, exactly. I was talking about my marking my essays, and I have to let that slip into tomorrow. So. Have you had rum and relax? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Uh, that's quite funny actually because my dad's completely the opposite so I've had two conversations with him in the last week about a dinner in over a year's time <laughs> <laughs> and Christmas day um, when we're going to arrive and what time we're going to arrive <laughs> and I definitely sometimes get that kind of anxiety around timings and organisation which yeah. clearly comes from him yeah. I don't feel that happy about that I'd rather be there to relaxing get your dad's to me thank you I just want to say that there was a lot of pressure in my family about grades and stuff can I adopt yours Robert? yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of expectation you will do well I mean, it's funny, I remember my mum, so many years later, but my sister's older than me, and um, when the recession hit, not the trickle that we had, the recession going back a bit, um, you know, my mum was working six days a week, because my dad had been made redundant, and he was unemployed for a long period, just couldn't get work. Um, and so, you know, my, it kills me now, I think about it, she's working in a, bet, in a betting shop on Saturday, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong working in a betting shop, but she worked five days a week, and then she'd go to this betting shop, and people weren't always nice to her, you know, she was my mum. And, you know, she, my sister passed her A-levels, she did, you know, good Indian girl, she got three A's, they were very proud of her. Um, and she went into, one moment to work, and I was like, hey, you know, how's your choice? She's like, oh, I'm proud, I've got three A's. I'm like, great. So she's going to go get a job and start paying housekeeping. Which didn't make sense, you know, it was a recession, my mum was working six days a week. My mum was just like, no, she's going to university. And people there going, well, what are you doing that for? You need to get her working and paying in, into your home. And my mum's resources, my daughters will be educated. And again, that was one of those, you know, that my, my daughters just will be educated. Do you know what? I'm working six days a week. But it's not even a thought, it's that alien. And again, when you look at our family history, that's not surprising. Someone said to me the other day, are you the first, family to, in, the first person in your family to get a degree? <laughs> no. So look at my family history. I, I am a product of my family. You know, I'm not that, but, you know, so I'm not going to sit here, yes, of course I had to work hard and so on, but do you know what? When it came to getting car you know, dealt your cards, my family, you know, I didn't do too badly in the family, I landed in. The fact is that's not the case for everyone, and that's why I'm really passionate about education. Yeah? I grew up in an area where technically I should not have done as well as I did. Yes, I was top in my school, yes, I was at the awards ceremony many times at the end of the year for adults. But why should the place you're born in and how successful you are in life, by and large. Yeah, I think that's a real tragedy. And that's why I'm really passionate about working with schools 
to help give all children equal chance. You know, you can't choose a family you're born into. Chances are they love you dearly, but we only know what we know, don't we? Yeah. And the area we're born into, all that limits our chances. We've all seen the demographic stuff about if you're born in certain areas, you're likely to live for a short amount of time and people are born in other areas, that you're likely to get better access to healthcare than if you are in other areas, if there's tons around it. And for me, education is a thing that can really equalise that. Anybody else want to share out any other of their family cultural legacies? Because they're quite good fun. No. Thank you for those who did. The rest you can just chuckle. Everyone <laughs> smiles on your faces. I can see there's, there's clearly some, some, some amusing ones going on. So where does this fit in with authentic leadership? Well, how many of you have come across authentic leadership? So let's get some hands going in the air. Have you, you've heard of it? Yeah. Keep your hand up. Have you read anything on it? Yeah. I'm not surprised that there are a few hands going up. It's quite a new. Um, it's a new kid on the block, really, when it comes to, to leadership and leadership theories. Um, so I'd like to explain a bit about what it's about. And do you know what? It might end up being a passing fad. You know, only the test of time will tell, um, will tell us if it is. But there are some key things um, about authentic leaders. One of them is that they really know themselves. That's kind of like the key element of authentic leadership. And not only do they know themselves, but they keep working on themselves. Yeah. Hands up if you are training, have been training, or due to training down this. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you guys probably quite like to stop and understand about yourselves and helping other people do that as well. Yeah. And at a guess, knowing what the other community is like, you're probably also quite into being authentic, being true to yourselves. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely key, key, key foundation of authentic leadership. Okay. So, know, know thyself. Other ones are <coughs> know your values, which ties in to knowing yourself. You know, this you were talking about, you know, how do you get people to to get on board to move forward with you and you're a leader that's also lined up with your values. Is that right? Can I phrase that correctly? Yeah. So knowing your values and being able to stay true to them. Bill George has written a book called True North. It's one of the first books on authentic leadership. There aren't lots around. And the reason he calls it True North is that he says, you know what, in life, things will knock you off. Yeah, things will happen. They'll knock you off course. What authentic leaders do, not always straight away, because we're all fallible humans, is they get back to their true north. What helps them also get back to their true north is knowing their purpose. What, what are they trying to do? Why are they here? Now, I think that's a really tough one to know. Mm -hmm. what, what, what am I here to do to achieve? You know, and some people, you know, I admire those people who are five years old can tell you what they want to be when they grow up, and they are that. Yeah, I didn't figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up until about four years ago. Anybody here know what their true purpose is? I mean, really, you know that this is what I'm about, this, this is my calling in life. Anybody be like, yes, I know that, 100%. Yeah, a few hands go up. Brilliant, well done. I don't think it's easy. Yeah. And it evolves and grows. But knowing what your purpose is, something authentic leaders are really good at doing, and again, it brings them back. And incidentally, authentic leaders, they don't, They're not driven by being a leader. You know, it's kind of idea of, hey, I'll lead and I'll boss everybody around, but I'll tell them what to do and I'll look good and I'll get the company car and I'll be on the golf course, you know, on a Friday or whatever. No, they're driven by a purpose. They're driven by a desire to make change, to do something. And you know what? As a result, they end up being a leader. Yeah? Steve Jobs. There's a really, um, there's a really interesting um, little story. I don't know how true it is, but apparently he was trying to get John... John Scully from Coca-Cola to come over to Apple. <coughs> and you know, they weren't talking about pensions or deals or clothes packages. He said, look, John, do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life? Do you want to change the world? <laughs> <laughs> Can't let me talk about pensions then, do you? Like, yeah, it's a bit hard. You know, Steve Jobs, he cited a lot, you know, he has been one of the, the great leaders of our, our modern, modern times. But you know, his purpose, he wanted to make a difference to the world, you want to revolutionise technology. 
It's a point that someone told me recently that when um, the first Max, one of the first Mac models they were doing, started up, he asked how long it took for it to start up. And it was something like takes five seconds. He worked out what that meant if everybody had a Mac and how many human years would be wasted in starting up a computer to make it faster. Yeah. Now, you know, I think of that when I start up my PC and <laughs> it's chugging away and it's <laughs> updating again and I haven't got that long to get done what I want to get done. Yeah? Purpose, making a difference, stick to your true north. I think a really, um, a really key part of authentic leadership is integrity. And again, this comes back to kind of what are your intentions? Are, are your reasons honourable? And I've actually shared my reasons with people so they can, they can join in and understand that they're honourable. And integrity is a funny one. I, I, I came across a really nice definition that I'd like to, like to share with you. And that's that integrity is like a chiropractic alignment. So our thoughts match our words, match our deeds. Yeah, and that again is a trait that you just see in authentic leaders time and time again. Yeah, they have a high sense of integrity. Again, doesn't mean they never wobble. Please don't be thinking this is a perfection piece, because it's not. Yeah, more human, more fallible. But this is something authentic leaders are really good at. You know, it's just part of who they are. Because yeah, they're on that kind of voyage of self discovery. But a really good example of authentic leadership um, came last October, end of October 2014. I'm sure you're all aware that Richard Branson's trying to get in space. Mm. Yeah, and he's got his Virgin Galactic flights, and they're pretty expensive tickets. Anybody know how much they cost out of interest? Mm. What's that like look? Around a million or something. Like that. I think, I think Off my head was like, um, it's a quarter of a million for a ticket, which has probably gone up. Yeah, I don't know about you, I've got a quarter of a million lying around, but I can just be like, no brainer. <laughs> it's not like buying a coffee from Pret, is it? You know, it's not that kind of level of change. Um, <coughs> But last October, I'm sure you're aware that one of their Virgin Galactic test flights crashed. Mm. And it's really interesting to see Richard Branson's reaction when that happened. Because he came out, you know, on the, and let's face it, Virgin get a lot of press. Like, they do get a lot of press everywhere, when stuff's good. So when stuff's bad, you know, it's like a media frenzy, isn't it? So he came out on international TV and he said, Jock, this is an absolute tragedy. You know, we have lost our friend and our colleague. And we can't carry on with this programme until we understand what went wrong and make sure it never happens again. And they went on to say, if anybody who has signed up for a ticket wants a refund, then they can have it. You know, I'm going to go more. We need to more. We need to figure out. We need to understand what's going on. We can't continue. But we're committed to carrying on. And we're committed to carrying on because we believe the difference this will make to humans. Yes, the whole human race. This is going to make space flight possible and it's going to have a massive impact on people back on Earth. Through what we'll be able to do then because we get space more frequently, you know, satellites we can put up, accessing the internet for millions, so we'll carry on. But we need to pause some breath. Now, he could have come out with a load of spin. I bet, I don't know, but I bet there's not anything in terms of conditions to talk about, you know, if we crash you can have your money back. Interestingly, what happened is some people did ask for a refund, but several people also signed up for tickets. Yeah, there was analysis, there was critiquing on, on the internet over everything, but there were also hundreds of thousands of messages of support. And if you go online and you Google his, his, you know, his response on, on the media, you know, you watch him, he's not the most polished speaker in the world. You know, he's not Mr. Slick, I haven't spin doctors work it, here we go, PR been going at it, let me put it out there. He just speaks truly. We are going to carry on, this is important. Yeah, not for my bank balance, for the fact that we want to make a difference. But do you know what? This is a tragedy. And if you want your money back, that's why. Well, I think it's quite interesting when you think about that and you think about David Cameron's reaction with the London riots happened. Yeah, it's on holiday. Now, I'm, oh yeah, I'm a fan of leaders don't have to be there all the time. But it takes a lot of work before you don't have to be there. Secondly, there's something symbolic you know, in not coming back to your country when there are riots in your capital city. Yeah? 
and it jars, Mary, your face for picking up. I was away too. <laughs> Pardon? I was away at the time as well. Yeah, but we haven't elected you to be our Prime Minister, have we? I know, that's what everyone was saying when I was. Where is it? So, any questions about the point of next at the end? Any questions about authentic leadership? Mm. There's, not enough, there's not enough of it. Of it. Yeah. 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 Just failing from the top. Because yeah. there's people working from the place of ego. I agree. Mm. I think interestingly, the age we live in is increasing. And I see that in a lot of companies that you know that we all know and love. Does anybody come across Airbnb? Mm. Yeah. You know, I love Airbnb. <laughs> you know, and there, there are a whole set of companies now that, that we get to choose in a way that we couldn't before because the internet wasn't around. Well, I think we see more authenticity coming through. But yeah, if we're driven by ego, we're not, you know, we're not actually being able to be authentic. And actually, I think even for people in those positions, it can be quite satisfying. Just sometimes we can be so busy we don't get the time to reflect to figure out how yeah. satisfying it is. And I should say, you know, leadership is not about kind of you know, being authentic as a leader is one thing, but there's a whole set of other skills, leadership and management, that need to be in place as well. You know, if we pick Steve Jobs or Richard Branson, they know their stuff. You know, Steve Jobs and those computers, he you know, he, he could make decisions, he, he developed those skills as well. Yeah? Richard Branson the same. And authenticity. I think the thing that sits best about authenticity is it's moving us away from saying you should be this and you should be that and a good leader is this and a good leader is that. It's about going, who are you? Bring your own personal brand of leadership. And you know, as a coach, that feels very congruent to me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> curious that you've picked as two leaders, two people in the business. Mm -hmm. Whereas when people normally use the word leader, it's in respect to a politician. Can you think of any good ones? <laughs> this is not a good question. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you one thing. Um, so, uh, just come out of election, and you know, five years ago, I remember seeing Nick Clegg in the leadership debate. And I remember watching my boyfriend, my best friend, and I were watching it, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Because he came across really well. Mm -hmm. Came across so well, so genuine, so authentic. You know, he really just. <coughs> you know, and then we saw you know, the polls kind of made him deserve it, almost kind of ignored him in, in that first leadership debate. And then the next time, it rounded on him, kind of like, oh, we better, better get serious about the leadership end, because this, this guy's making some noise. And I think it's a real tragic tragedy that the Lib Dems have, have had the fall that they've had. Mm. Yeah, and I'm not going to go into analysis by like my own pop theories. Um, and I thought, you know, for me, the key moment in that, you know, you again, you can go online and watch Nick Clegg's apology about tuition fees. Mm, yeah. At that point, for me, he, he does a great thing. He is honest, he apologises for it. Yeah, he explains why. But he loses integrity because of it. Mm. Because the reasons he said that, you know, we made a promise we'd never be able to keep. It's like, well, you know, that's great you're being honest, but you've got, you know, a failing in just leadership skill. Your decision making for, for your manifesto was, was weak. So now I'm struggling to trust you, I'm struggling to believe you, I'm struggling to believe you've got what you need to be a great leader. So I would have, five years ago, said, well, keep an eye on Nick Clegg, let's see how he's doing. Um, and there's plenty of analysis going on now. Anybody else? Anybody got any politicians they think are really? In terms of authentic, there's like, um, a guy I listen to quite a lot, he's called Pre Mohika, he's like the president from Uruguay. Okay. And he did loads of like authentic things, for example, like legalising marijuana, so that he can kind of know who's actually taking a certain amount, and then those people from the pharmacy, and then they can kind of treat yeah. them. He did those like, really kind of interesting, kind of radical things, and he's really authentic. Yeah. He's really good. I don't know if you've heard of him. No, I haven't. I can get the name after that. Yeah. Really so, authentic leadership. Yeah, it's actually allowing leaders to be who they are, not who they should be, not what we think, you know, you should be this kind of leader, you should be that kind of leader, transformational, transactional, or whatever it is. There's a whole raft of leadership styles you can adopt. And I'm not saying any of them are wrong. I think, you know, everything has a time and a place. But I think as, you know, leaders are in positions of leadership, actually knowing who we are, knowing what we're about, is really crucial. And one of the places I see that as being fundamentally important is in schools. Sorry, I'm just wondering to what extent do you think charisma is important mm -hmm. in the... I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, so the question was, what extent do you think charisma is important as a leader? Um, there's a really good book by a guy called Jim Collins called Good to Great. 
and he analysed how certain companies, you know, have one. Oh, have you heard of Griggs Great? Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? Yeah, brilliant. So he analysed how a group of companies managed to hit kind of a trajectory and, and just outperform the market. And it's a really, you know, it's a very analytical piece of research in that he looks at the leaders and they're expecting charismatic, you know, the kind of, hey, I'm on Time magazine, I'm going to save the day now, I've got my, my pants outside my tights and my cape flying, and here we go. <laughs> That's what they were expecting. It's not what they found. They found that these leaders were actually quite quiet. Yeah, they're very humble. Yet yeah, they weren't the most, you know, outgoing, extroverted, charismatic. And I'm not saying they couldn't be, yeah, so I don't think, you know, if you are charismatic or extroverted, you can't, you can't have that. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that stereotypical view that we have of a leader. So how much do I think it's important? It's what you do with it that counts. And actually, I think what that really showed me was that, you know, sometimes it can just be a lot of hot air. Thank you. So, for me, leadership makes a difference. That's what I believe. I believe leadership makes a fantastic difference. Anybody ever had a really good boss who brought the best out of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Anybody had a really bad boss? <laughs> you do. <laughs> I had one straight off to the other. I had a really great really boss, and I was like, yeah, 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 and I'm a really bad boss. I was like, oh, rubbish, I can't do anything. And I de skilled. Yeah, we had that. Mm -hmm. So, leadership makes a difference, and that's on an individual level. Organisationally, if you've got that good boss, great. If you've got that bad boss, ooh. Yeah. So I believe it makes a difference. Um, and a lot of leaders get into positions of leadership. I'm talking kind of in organisations, I'm not talking about thought leaders necessarily. Um, but in organisations, a lot of leaders get into that place organically. So you kind of go, oh, you know. You're really good at that job, have a promotion, and got a team. And you're like, oh, okay, I was really good at that job, okay, I've got a team, great people, people, ooh, that's cool. Oh, wait, you seem to be doing well, get into a good job, have another promotion, have a big team. And what often happens is, we don't get trained in how to lead, and how to manage a team, how to make that work. Okay. Now, you know, my background is I'm a qualified teacher. I've taught in every age group from reception 16. Um, so I learned to work with children. I then joined the John Lewis Leadership Programme. Very lucky to get onto that programme. And on that, they really focus on teaching you leadership and management skills. Because I had to learn how to work with adults, and there was a difference. You know, the little ones are far easier. <laughs> Quite often, a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah? And they don't give you any of that, let me say it, brown the bushes. They just tell you how it is. You know where they are. Kids are just naturally authentic, I think, aren't they? Yeah. We lose that. I'm not sure where, but we lose that at some point. Yeah? I can see the teachers in the room kind of going, yeah, it's so much easier with kids, isn't it? So much easier. So what I find in my work with schools, when I'm helping to come outstanding, is the missing piece of the puzzle is often the cultural journey that needs to happen. And for me, this is one of the primary jobs of a leader. There are lots of other jobs. Yeah? Normally people are quite good at them, particularly the management functions. But what people are not necessarily trained on is how to create a culture for success. Also known as a high-performing team. Yeah? So what happens is you get a culture by accident. Now let me clarify what I mean by culture. <coughs> culture is the social norms and practices of a group of people who come together regularly. So I talked about my family culture. Yeah? I've played in a band. We have a culture. I've worked in organisations. They have a culture and teams within it have a culture. In schools, every classroom is a mini culture. Yeah. If you think about think about some groups of friends. You know, some groups of friends it's all fun and nice, all the rest of it. Some groups of friends it might not be. Some parts of the family it's like that. Others it's not. Yeah, and you kind of slip into the expectations of that culture. Yeah. And if you try and make a break, you feel quite uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because cultures will happen, and normally we let them happen by accident which means they can be subject to the strongest force, they're a blend of the personalities, but they're not necessarily created. A culture that's created by design 
you know, it's based on values, it's shared, it's talked about, and it's, you know, it's crafted. But it's a very conscious activity. Most of the cultures we have in our lives are actually quite a, an unconscious activity. Animals have a culture. Yeah. John Lewis, famous for its culture. Apple, again, famous for its culture. It's the same that you, know, you leave John Lewis in any one place you can go and that's Apple. Because you only step up. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So I want to talk a little bit about culture by, by design, if that's okay. Because for me, this is the role of the leader, it's also the role of the authentic leader within that. But I also know that when I've been sitting in the room, by this point in the lecture, my bottoms begin to get a little bit numb. Yeah? And I could have done with a little jiggle. Yeah? <laughs> Probably not in my seat. So I'm going to ask you to get up, go and talk to somebody else who isn't, you know, within your two near you. Yeah? To give you legs a bit of a stretch. And just, um, just have one, one kind of culture, one group you really enjoy being part of and that is actually you know, a, a joy to be part of. Not one of the ones that perhaps brings you down a little bit, but one of the ones that you're really happy to be part of. So, you know, for me, um, the guys I get to work with in Heads Up, they're my favourite guys. As well as, you know, my boyfriend, because we've got a little culture going on there. <laughs> yeah? They're my favourite ones. So just, just walk around a little bit, because at this point, you know, the energy level drops for you guys, and you've got to go a bit now. Yeah.